Okay. Hi, everybody. Hope you're doing well. Let me change this and say hello, everybody. Happy Monday. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start promoting it. So hang on just one second. All right. Hello, Betty. Good to see you. Benetta, welcome aboard. Brand new. Let's see. Brianna, good to see you. Let's see. Chris, good to see you, buddy. Christina, good to see you. Hey. Hey Deborah, good to see you. Deb, did you did you did you set up a call with me? Hey De and Deb, if you need the link, just let me know. I'll sh I'll shoot you a text or I'll plug it in the um the chat box here. Hey Jada, you're the designated guest of the year, presenter of the hour. So I'm gonna I just promoted you, Nita, but I'm gonna also make you a um. I think there's one more thing I'm gonna do. Jeff, good to see you, buddy. All the way up from beautiful sunny Michigan. Lisa, good to see you. Liz, good to see you. Let's see. Michael O'Keefe, good to see you, buddy. Um, I just spoke to someone up your way, Mike, earlier today. I'll keep you posted on that one. Michael Williams, good to see you. All the way from Hollywood and Beverly Hills and land of the nice cars. <laughs> Randy, good to see you, buddy. Roger, good to see you. Shirley, how are you? Good to see you. Whoops, promote. And it's okay. Susan Murray, good to see you, Susan. Tom Silvestri, hey, Tom. Anita, good to see you. All right, another LA student. Tom Silvestri, that's you. Tom Zachlar, good to see you. Let's see, did I miss anybody here? Um, Tom, Roger, let's see, Randy. PF, good to see you, buddy. I think that must be, uh, let me check a few more. Uh, Ursula, good to see you. And Tony Moore. Hey, Ursula, I think I saw you did set up a call. If you could um, let me know that, that would be great. Um, Okay, so Gina, hang on just one second. Let me go to panelists. Go down to G for Gina. Okay, so you should be, so Gina, you should be all set now. Okay. Um, yep. Yeah. Hope you guys are, everybody's doing well here. Um, Real quick, before Gina starts, does anybody need to see my the link to my calendar? Um, so Deb, do you need do you need this the link? I'll just let me know. Uh, let me let me go ahead, Gina. Let me go ahead and put my link in the chat box here, real quick. Okay. I'm um, sorry about that. Let's see strategy. Oops, it help if I spell it correctly. Right. Not tra tra tragedy, but strategy. <laughs> Okay, let's see. Copy and paste. Okay. Okay, G. All right, GP, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so today we're gonna to talk about listing appointments and we're gonna go through all that. Um, and first off, I just wanna start with a couple of questions. Out of curiosity, let me switch this over to gallery so I can see all y'all. Um, who here is a one-stop listing versus, who here's a two-stop listing or doesn't know what a one-stop versus a two-stop is? Let's get hands or just talk because I'm cool with interactions also. So you're a two, you're a two. Who else is a two? You're a two-two? <laughs> Got it depends. Pardon me? I said it depends on the listing, right? If it's a $3 million house, it's a two-step. If it's a you know lower end of property, it's a one-step. 
in my book. That's how I do it. All right. We got a one stop down there, too. All right, go on. I don't know what a one or two is. Well, okay, so a one stop, good question. A one stop thing, and I did not used to know what this is. Uh, I used to not know what this is either. A one stop listing is I set the appointment, I show up at your property, we list the house, I walk out with paperwork. A two stop listing is I go to your house, I meet you, I view everything, I leave, I crunch all my numbers to see what I should list at, and then I come back in and we sign the paperwork at that point. So, or I send the paperwork later for you to, like, for instance, a DocuSign or something like that. That's a two stop. Um, so I was a two stopper for forever. And when I wanted to really get my time back in my life back, I switched over to a one stop. And so that's what I'm gonna be teaching today is a one stop listing appointment. Um, so, all right, so moving from that, who knows what the biggest or the number one complaint is, getting my notes pulled up. Who knows what the number one complaint is about listing agents? They don't listen. <laughs> That's one. I love it, Pia. That's awesome. And they don't read and they don't know their contracts. <laughs> um, so anyone else got any ideas on what the number one complaint is about agents? Listing agents specifically. Trust. Trust. Yeah. Is that it or no? What's number one? It's not number showing up on time. Oh my gosh, that is a biggie. There's realtor time, which is always five minutes to 15 minutes late. The number one complaint that people have about listing agents is this. They put a sign in my yard and I never heard from them again. And so because that's the number one complaint, I wanted to make sure that I built uh, something in this to handle that as well. So that's built into this to handle that. Um, when Let's get some feedback first before we dive into this. What are your guys's like, what are concerns about listing appointments or what are your thoughts around listing appointments or what would you like to maybe see if we can get addressed or helped with? Like what would help you all if we're gonna do a whole class on listing appointments? Anything? You've gotta be something out there that y'all are like, this, there's something that makes you nervous about it. Man, crickets. All right, I'm diving in. <laughs> oh, hang on, let me check my chat box. Um, discussing commission, beautiful. Pricing, CMAs, all right, they're coming in. Having the best presentation, perfect. All right, let's go through and address that. We'll definitely talk about CMAs and we'll definitely talk about discussing commission, um, pricing, et cetera, and then presentation. Um, so, and as we're going through this, if you guys have questions or whatever, just like raise your hand, yell at me, put something in the chat box. I'll try and stay on top of that one as well um, so that we can go through and make sure you get all your questions answered. Um, first off, I am in the process of moving my mother-in-law, so I'm not at home. But if I was at home, I was going to show you the listing presentation binder that I used to use. So it was a three ring binder. It had every single piece of paper in it that I could ever use. It was like this thick. And I drug that thing out on every listing presentation and I made myself memorize the entire thing. And you could see people's eyes when I would go on a listing presentation and I would slap that down. You could see their eyes just go like this. And I occasionally would have someone ask me, are you gonna go through that whole thing? And I would start to joke and go, well, yeah. And they'd be like, how long is it gonna take? Like six hours. And then I'd laugh, but it took two hours. I mean, it took a long time to go through this stupid thing. And my listing, uh, uh, listing appointment to listings taken ratio was around 50%. And I really wasn't happy with that. So I wanted to pump it up a bit. And when I heard about this listing presentation, I shifted everything. And my list price or list um, appointments to listings taken ratio went all the way up to 85%. And it was 85% because on occasion, either I showed up there and there was nobody there. So I got a no show or I had my appointment was rescheduled, or I did not want to take it, although that was not very often. If I couldn't get them priced right, then I would not take it. But pretty much if I got the listing appointment, I walked in and I took your listing. And this is how I did it. So my list presentation became a yellow legal pad of paper. And that's pretty much it. So here's exactly the process and what I did. 
So when I set up my listing, um, when I set up my listing appointments, I only would do listing appointments on Fridays. So I didn't go any other day to go list your house. I had a standing 9, 12, 3, and 6 p.m. And those were my appointments. So, and I usually had four appointments booked every single Friday. I found when I shifted my week over like that, that I could better control my time. And I also, does anyone here have that thing that if someone calls you for a listing appointment, you're like, drop everything and run over there? Like any hands on that one at all? Mm -hmm. but yeah, it's a, it's a sense of, there's underneath it, there's a sense of lack. And if you think about it, if I have an appointment, I want you guys to think of yourselves as like doctors or attorneys or uh, good attorneys or something, dentists, something along those lines. If I go to book an appointment with my doctor, minus, you know, I cut my leg off and I've got entrails all over the floor, if, uh, or, you know, or whatever, bleeding everywhere. If I go to book an appointment with a doctor, I never get to call the doctor and go, yeah, I, I want to be there right now. I mean, that does not happen. There's ER for that. But a regular doctor appointment, they're like, oh, we have Tuesday at two or four. And that's it. And we just accept it. So we get paid as much as doctors if we're doing our job right. We should be able to do the same exact thing. I'm available Friday at this time and this time. So I set aside one day only for listings. That was the first thing I did. The second thing I added in and shifted around was I started doing a pre-listing packet. So it doesn't really matter what all is in a pre-listing packet except for these items that I made sure were in mind. The first one was I had in there, um, I think she said, sorry, I'm gonna try and keep up on the chats too. On Fridays, I did 9, 12, three and six. That gave me plenty of time for my listing appointment and to travel to the next place. So it gave me plenty of time. I found that that just worked really well with my schedule. Also circling back around to that again, um, I never, if I had anyone say, well, I work and those don't work, I would say, can you get like a little bit of time off? And they would go, oh yeah, I can. And they were never not happy to take time off on a Friday. I mean, nobody ever was like, oh no, that could never happen. They, we just did. Um, okay, so I had put together a pre-listing packet. The things that were the most important in my pre-listing packet was that it had an error in it somewhere. And I wanted that error in there, one tiny misspelling error, because somebody, if, if I'm dealing with, we talked about the personalities a, a few weeks ago, that high C personality is going to tell me the second that we sit down, oh, by the way, there's an error in this. And then I know instantly that this is what I've got. I've got a high C personality. So I'm going to put a tiny error in there. Um, I also am going to have some piece of paper that has my name, their name, and EXP on it that they have to sign. So um, property disclosures in most states, that will definitely do the ticket. So that would be slid inside of it, folded in half. And I would tell them, hey, look, I'm gonna send over a pre-listing packet. There's a disclosure form in there, fill that out to the best of your ability. I don't, I would like to have them sign it. I don't care as much if they do or don't. I just want something in there that they see that hopefully I can get them to sign ahead of time that's got those pieces of information because I want them attached to this. I then asked them to make a copy of the key. And then inside, so I had these packets already built. And then I would just do a little yellow sticky that said something like, looking forward to seeing you Friday at three. And, and that was in there. So that's all, they were already pre-built. All I had to do was do my stickies and then suck my sticky in there and send those off. So those, I wanted enough time for those to get off. If there wasn't enough time, then I would do a runner and have a runner run it. But I always, that's another reason why I push my stuff out till Friday. Okay, so an error in it. Uh, paperwork that they have to sign and please get a copy of the key made. So that always went out. Um, all right, when I showed up for the listing, I always made sure that I got there five or 10 minutes early, but it didn't show up at the door. I just drove the neighborhood. And because I wanna see, I wanna see, is there a dump next door to your house? Is there, you, you know, what is going on in this neighborhood? Is there train tracks right behind you? Stuff that you cannot pull on the CMA. So those kinds of features. If I, um, between a, a good CMA and a quick, short little drive around your neighborhood, I have everything that I need to know to list a standard cookie cutter house. And what I mean by a cookie cutter house is not the McMansion in a sea of ranches. 
I mean, this neighborhood was all built around the same time. They're all around the same square footage. They all kind of line up. If I've got, if I've got that type of a situation and a short drive around your house, I've got everything I need to know um, on where to price it and what we're doing with it. McMansions, that's a different conversation or anomaly properties. That's a different conversation, which, you know, requires doing CMAs differently and all that kind of stuff. So we're just kind of talking cookie cutter houses today. Um, okay, so I showed up, um, drove your neighborhood, and then I made sure that when I got out of my car and I knocked on your door, it was dead on time. I mean, dead on exactly time. I had the key box in my hand, the super key box. I had my sign, my yard sign in my hand. And when I knocked on your door, I, I knocked on your door, I set the sign on the door, I mean, set the sign on the porch, I put the key box on your door and I had the bottom part of the key box where the key goes, I had that in my hand. And when I knocked on your door, I, and I would take a step backwards and then I would say, hi, my name is Gina from EXP. We had a six o'clock appointment and exaggerated look at the watch, it's six o'clock. And is, did you get a chance to get that key made? And they almost always said no. And they're a little distant, I mean, there's a key box on their door and there's a sign in their yard. Um, and they're always a little taken back. And it was like, it's okay, no big deal. Do you mind if I come sit my stuff down? So I would walk in and it's okay if I set my stuff at the kitchen table. You want to do your business at the kitchen table. That's where decisions are made in a family. It's not made at a couch or at some other room or standing around. It's made at the kitchen, not even the dining room table. I want to be at your kitchen table. And when you go to sit down at the kitchen table, don't sit at the head of the table where you've got people on either side of you. Sit on the side of the table so you've got the head and the other person. So you're talking like this, not like this, like a tennis match. Okay, so is it okay if I set my stuff down at the kitchen table? Absolutely. Um, do you wanna look at the house first? Actually, I, I'd rather not. I'd rather, is it okay if I just ask you a few questions first? I mean, I don't know if you like me and frankly, I don't know if you like if I like you and if I can just ask you a few questions, then is that okay? And they're gonna say yes. And then I'm gonna say, oh, can I get a glass of water? And I want that glass of water because if anybody, I want for two reasons. One is if um, I want them waiting on me. I want them bringing me stuff. But two, if someone asks me a question and I don't know the answer that they asked me, I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna drink my water and I'm gonna think Whatever about you it. pulled out of that basket, make sure you put back. Say that again. Oh, was that not supposed to be part of it? Do we have something? Nope, okay. So I'm gonna ask for that glass of water and I'm gonna use that as my time to be able to think so that I can come up with a decent answer to your question and I don't have to wing it. And it seems completely natural. Um, okay. I want to talk a little bit about the emotional part of what's going on from their point of view. So when I, you don't know me, um, I first walk into your property, maybe you barely know me. What do you guys, if you had to name where they are, how they're feeling right now, I've just put a sign on your door and a key box on your door and I walked in and sat down at your kitchen table, how, someone shout out to me kind of what you think their emotions are, where they are emotional, how they're feeling. Oh boy, this is real now. Yep. <laughs> yep, defensive, excellent. That came up in the chat box. Yep, defensive, nervous. Don't you think, don't you think putting the key box on the door is pushing it? No, but do I think it's ballsy? Yes. Yes, I do. <laughs> I absolutely do. Um, so, so yes, um, presumptive, Brianna, yep, yeah, exactly. That's how they're feeling, okay? I have to get them calmed down. So when, when people are talking back and forth and one person's doing a lot of talking, like I'm doing right now, which I don't like doing, and the other person is more listening, who do you think feels the calmest and the most like love and like the conversation's going great, the, the speaker or the quiet one? Speaker. Speaker. The, the speaker. The speaker uh, feels like this, you guys are right. This is so interesting. When there's a two-way conversation, I've gone to parties where I just ask the question and someone would talk for half an hour and they will walk away and they're like, oh my God, she's the most amazing person ever. Like she knows everything. I, I don't know 
anything. I haven't said anything. You did all the talking, but you feel the love. So what I need to do is I need to get you calmed down on this emotional journey because listing your property is an emotional journey. So I'm going to sit down and we're going to sit at the table. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put a business card. I'm going to get my water and I'm going to put a business card in front of both of you. And then I'm going to pull out my yellow legal pad of paper and my pen. And then I'm going to go, oh, hang on a second. Wait, wait. And I'm going to dig around in my purse until I find my phone. And I'm going to go, hang on, hang on. And I'm going to do this. And I'm going to put my phone on mute. And I'm going to set my phone face down. Now, I have my phone set up so that it used to have it set up so that it would uh, vibrate. Now I have it set up so it goes flashy, flashy and vibrates. But I want it to do that. That's all I want it to do. I don't want it to ring totally cool if people call me they like that actually and i'm just going to reach over and silent my phone every single time so hang on have had several agents with icon status let's say they okay so here's in the comments have had several agents with icon status say they go to a listing point with the assumption that they 100 have the listing put in the key box on it's definitely an action to this yep i definitely going to put that key box on okay so i'm going to i'm going to let my phone go flashy flashy i'm going to turn it off every single time what I want here is I want twofold. The first thing is I want them to turn their phone off. I want them to realize that I'm here in front of you and I want your undivided attention. The second one, I'll go circle back around with at the end and I'll show you what the other purpose is of turning that phone off, okay? Next comment, if someone did this to me, I would not hire them. You're right, I get it, I really do. The thing that, who said that by the way? Lisa, where are you Lisa? Let me see you. Hang on. Where are I'm you? I'm right here. I know. If someone put a key box on my door and did did all that, there's not a chance. I uh, I kind of go by the go giver, mm -hmm. and I don't play the Grant Cardone hard sell or this or that or whatever. If somebody put a key box on my door and brought, if they bring a sign, that's one thing. But you did that, you would have fired yourself from the minute you walked up on the doorstep. I love that. What personality type are you? Out of curiosity, out of the disc, do you know? D. Hi, D. Yeah. Yep. We're one percent of the personality in the entire mm -hmm. world. Yep. Sixty-seven percent are S. If I put a key box on your door, you'll sign with me. Oh gosh, I can't even imagine that. <laughs> I, I, I would cringe at doing it. I hear you. I really do. Um, when I first, I love that you said that. By the way, the first time Thank I you. had someone go through my um, my flyer and tell me to take the price off my flyer. I said, you're out of your own mind. If I walk up and I see a flyer and there's no price on it, I am never buying your house. And they literally were like, are you a high D? Uh-huh. Yeah, you're a high D. <laughs> I want to see a price. And here's another thing I want to see. I want to see the dimensions of the master bedroom, which I know we're not supposed to call a master anymore. And we can't put that in anymore. But I, if I'm looking for myself, the first thing I need to know is my mat, my bedroom furniture is going to fit. And I don't want to go look at about a bunch of houses to try to figure that out. Give me the dimensions. Yep. You're a high D. That's the same way I operate, but we're this much of the world. Yep. yep. Thank you for that though. I super appreciate it. Um, okay. So I'm going to give both of you my cards. I'm going to turn my phone off and then I'm going to, with my yellow legal pad of paper and pen, I'm going to say, all right. So out of curiosity, what freaks you out about this whole situation? And then I'm just going to stop and I'm going to be looking at you and I'm going to pick up my pen like I'm going to ready to write down and I'm going to wait too long, just like a, a beat or maybe two too long. And then I'm going to look up and I'm going to go, well, there must be something. I mean, there must be something that makes you nervous about this. And then usually somebody will say something and I write it down. And then again, I wait a little bit too long and hang on, I don't know how to mute other people. Um, so I'll wait a little bit too long and then I'll look up again and I'll be like, is there just one thing? And cause if there is, it's going to be really easy. And then one partner, one of the, the two people will usually start pouring out everything that makes them nervous. I don't know what, how are we going to find another house? What if we don't find another house? Um, what do I do with all my jewelry, guns, name it, who cares, whatever. Uh, what about this? What about this? What about this? I don't know what your commission is. What about the pricing? I need to, whatever it is, let them just pour it out. And I just write it all down. That's all I do. And as I'm doing that, 
they're calming down more and more and more because they're the ones that are speaking. So I'm just writing it all down and I just let it go and I keep on writing. And then when it, I'll wait again, when you can tell that it's sort of hit a natural close, I'll wait again, a pause too long or a beat too long. And then I'll go, okay, is this everything? Is this everything? And I'm nodding my head, yes. Is this everything? And I'll usually get a yes. And I'm like, okay. And I will literally take my pad of paper and pen and just shove it aside and go, all right. And then I just answer the questions. So if they talk about commission, we talk about commission. If they talk about uh, what do I do with my jewelry, guns, prescription pills, showings, you know, time, new house, all that, we just talk about that. And if, it, if we don't, if commission's never mentioned, I never ever talk about commission. I already have it filled out on my, uh, my listing paperwork. That is the one box I'm gonna fill in. I will not fill in the price box, but I will always fill in the commission box because if I need to, I'll just cross it off and, and redo it. Although I don't want to. I really, really don't want to do that. Um, and I will do everything I can to hold it. By the way, as far as commission goes, you should know at least five objections to handling commission and you should be able to have them in your back pocket and you should understand the concepts so that you can pull them out as you need them one at a time. I don't, I'm not a big, huge proponent of memorizing any scripts that I'm doing over the phone. If I'm doing anything over the phone, I don't memorize anything. I have it written down in front of me and I read it. But if it's something in person, like pricing scripts or commission handling scripts, those you need to have memorized and you need to understand the concepts so that you can articulate them and bring them out as, they, as you need them. You generally won't need more than, you should know a good three. You might need as many as five, and that's usually about all the, the more that you're ever gonna need on handling commission objections and that. But have your paperwork filled out in advance, because um, if it's not mentioned, it's not mentioned. Oh, and by the way, when I listed, I listed at six, but I did three and a half my side and two and a half at the other side. A big part of that was I did a lot of short sales and so I, and the bank used to come after us for our commission. So I would tell people if the, if the buyer's agent ever found out about it, and occasionally they did and they said something. I'm like, if the bank comes after us, I take the hit, you don't. Or um, because of the cost of listing the properties, photography, drone photography, et cetera, that's why I do that. So, so that's what I did on mine. It's just me personally, you guys can do whatever you guys want to do. Um, but that's on mine. Okay, so emotional journey. Um, how do you guys feel that they are now when all I've done is just talk to them about what's most important to them? So where are they emotionally now? They were nervous. Now, where are they? Calm. They're calm. They're very calm. Um, you've handled their questions. You've answered everything. You've come across really competent and handle it. Um, does anyone know what to do if you don't know the, besides drinking water, um, if you don't know the answer to the question, there, there's just no way you could know it. Does anyone have a way to handle that, that they like? All right, so here's what I, I do. Done, I'll get back to you. Perfect, that's it, that's it exactly. It's, it's completely fine to say, I don't know the answer, or, or I don't say it that way. That's a really good question. Let me get back to you on that one. And then you've got something to call them back on. Um, I learned this trick, I used to work for the county and they did a whole, uh, because we were government employees, they had to come in and teach us about customer service because God knows there wasn't any of it going on. Um, but they came in and they taught us this. They said, if you, if I walk into a McDonald's and I order a Big Mac, which I would not do, but if I walked into McDonald's and I ordered a Big Mac and they give me a Big Mac and I give them my, whatever Big Mac costs, let's say three bucks, and I give them my three bucks, do, do I feel like they've done any extraordinary customer service? I gave them three bucks, they gave me a Big Mac. I don't. No. I don't feel anything, okay? If I order a Big Mac and I give them my three bucks and they give me a cheeseburger, how do I feel? Cheeseburger cheated. <laughs> I'm pissed, right? If I go in and I order a Big Mac and they give me a cheeseburger. And then I go back and tell them, look, you gave me a cheeseburger, not a Big Mac. And they go, I am so sorry. Sit down, I'm gonna bring you your Big Mac, it's totally cool. And they keep the cheeseburger 
and they bring me a Big Mac and a chocolate shake. I'm really, really sorry, here's a chocolate shake. Now, how do I feel? I feel like exactly, number one, I feel completely loved, okay? I won't and can't feel that unless there's something that I don't know or there's a mistake made. So whenever someone has a question that I don't know, that's actually a massive opportunity for me to shine because a lot of people either will say, I don't know, or they'll say, I'll get back to you. But if, if you guys are out there dealing with customer service, how many times does somebody say, I'll get back to you? And then it's crickets. You never hear anything. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's normal. The bar is super, super, super low. So all it is, is that's a really good question. Let me get back to you on that one. So, all right. So I've got them completely calmed down now. Now I need to, so part one of the listing appointment is just to bond with the human being. That's it. I just want to bond with you. I want to bond with you and I want you really, really calm. Part two is I'm going to now segue into the CMA. I've got them all calm. They were stressed. Now I've got them calm. And now I'm going to say, um, after we've answered all their questions, I'm going to segue in. Do you guys want to know kind of what's going on in your neighborhood? And that's my segue into CMA. And so I'm going to go into my CMA. My CMA, I don't call it a CMA. I call it a property positioning report. And I tell them that. And I'm, so if anyone's, um, when I'm talking and I'm lead generating, they're like, can you just send me a CMA? No. I can't, I don't do CMAs. And I let that sit there for a minute. And then I go, what I do is a property positioning report. It's a bunch of numbers. And I can't just send you a bunch of numbers. I can go over it with you the first time. And once I go over it with you, I can send you numbers from that point forward because you'll know how to read it and what I'm talking about. So a property positioning report is this. I'm going to pull your standard CMA. Here's everything that's sold, plus or minus 200 square feet, bedroom, bathroom, whatever, all that, that's standard CMA. I am then going to, um, I'm then gonna look at everything pending because that will tell me what's trending. I'm also gonna contact the agents of what's pending because um, usually, the, well, because the price isn't there yet. And so I'm going to ask them, even if it's not, you're not supposed to do it in that area because you weren't supposed to do it in Washington state, I still call the next because a lot of times they'll tell me anyway. So I'm looking at days on market and price and the difference between my sold to what is pending because pending is, is right now today, what's going on. I'm looking for the trend. Is it going up or down on either one of those? And then the third thing I'm looking at is active. And the reason why I'm looking at active is because that's my property positioning part. So I will look at how many actives there currently are. The market right now is so hot that this one doesn't apply as much, but as it softens and weakens, this one's really going to apply. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at how many units sell in that, in that neighborhood or school or whatever, uh, uh, boundaries I put around that, that CMA, how many units sell per month over time? And so I'm going to draw down, I'm going to literally go January, February, March, April, five, four, three, four, four, five, five, six, five, four, three. And that will give me the average of how many units sell per month. I'm looking at actives because if an average of five houses sell in that neighborhood per month, and there's currently seven listed and your house, Mr. Seller is going to be number eight, that means I have to have you priced in the bottom five in order to sell this month. So that's why this is not, this is not as important in a super hot market, but as the market softens, this is a really good one to pull out. So if I don't price you in the bottom five, the only thing you've done is help your neighbor sell. So, so I'm going to look at that and that's a property positioning report. So it's a little bit more data than in a, in a standard CMA. So is any questions on property positioning and, and when to pull out the CMA and what and going over that? No, but it's good. Thank you. Okay. So that's the second part is going through the CMA. Now I'm a one-stop listing person because when I run my CMA, I, what I often found was that you'll see a range of there's a low end, a medium end, a high end, or at least a lower end than a higher end, or you see your price points kind of naturally break down. When I walk into your house and look at your living room, if your living room looks average, I'm going to list you at the medium price. If your living room looks phenomenal, I'm gonna go at the high price. If your living room is sketchy, I'm afraid to actually go into your bedrooms because I think that you can pretty much judge a house by how they're keeping their living room. So the second I walk in, I already know where I'm listing your house, low, medium, or high. So that's, how, that's where I narrow down that last step without looking at the rest of the property at all. Um, one caveat here, I will 
Okay, one time I took an overpriced listing. That's the only time I ever took it. I will not take an overpriced listing. I don't believe in taking an overpriced listing. That being said, there are times when you have the anomaly house, when you, when you crunch your numbers a bunch of ways and you're kind of just throwing a dart and you're hoping you hit it and you hope that the market will adjust for you. Meaning that if you're a shade low, the offers will come in a little higher with multiples. If you're too high, I'm going to adjust my price within two weeks and get it back down to where it should be. But if it's a cookie cutter house, I'm not going to take an overpriced listing. The one time I did, I sat down with the seller. It was on a very, very busy road. And we were very blunt about it is not going to sell for this price. And he said, I don't care anyway. If it doesn't sell, then I'm going to just rent it out to my brother. He's going to be here in, I don't know, two months or something like that. And I said, I'm not doing any marketing. I'm going to put a sign in your yard and that's it. That's all I'm going to do because I will pick up buyers all day long. I want you to know and understand that, that that's what we're going to do. And he's like, absolutely. That's what we're going to do. If I can get my price, great. If I can't, I can't. It didn't sell. I picked up a slew of buyers off of it. So if I am going to take an overpriced listing, I'm very, very upfront about why I'm not going to do it. It's not going to work. And if you insist and it's mutual and you understand I'm not going to put any money into it other than my sign in your yard, I'm okay with that. I will take it in that instance, but that's the only way I'm going to take it. Okay, so that's how I feel on overpriced listings. I'm not one to, to take a listing and then start knocking down the price every two weeks. I just, I'd rather not have to do that. I'd rather just list it and list it right out of the gate at the right price, okay? Um, so that's it on pricing. My last thing on pricing, I'm going to list, for the most part, I'm going to list on what I call bracket pricing. Do you guys know what bracket pricing is or have you run across that concept? I got Tom nodding yes on bracket pricing. Okay, so here's what bracket pricing is. Um, uh, my seller wants to list at two, she pick a number, 285. Seller wants to list at 285. And I'm gonna talk my seller into, depending upon what I think on the comps and what it can handle, either 275 or 300. And I'm gonna list on a bracket and I'm gonna tell my seller this. I'm gonna say, look, um, I would, I recommend that we price at 275, Mr. Seller. And here's why you're probably online doing this right now. You're probably doing, I need you to think like a buyer. You're probably online right now and you're probably looking and you're, and you've got like three to three and a quarter, three and a quarter, 350, 350, 400, whatever that bracket is. And you're looking at picture price, picture price, picture price, picture price. And you're literally going through and you're going, nope, nope, nope. Maybe yes. I have to keep you in that yes pile because that's our first showing. So I want to list you right dead on the bracket because I want to be able to pick up people that are looking at the, two, the 250 to 275 and the 275 to 300 people. And if I have you at 285, I'm only picking up people in that one bracket and I want to pick up both sides of that bracket. And, and I'm nodding my head yes and, and they get it. So I usually can get them to where I want to get them with that. Um, the other thing with that with, especially with the anomaly house where you're throwing the, the dart is if you're priced wrong, let's say you're priced at 285 and Mr. Seller only wants to reduce to 280, it's, 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 it doesn't do anything. It's nothing because there's no new eyes on that product. The only way to get new eyes on it is to bring it down another bracket. So in that case, 275, or if I'm dead at 275, I've got to bring it down to 250. I cannot do 260 and try it. It's not, there's no new eyes on this. The other caveat to this, and I learned this when I was uh, out in the Bay Area, working in the Bay Area, when you have very high prices or a very high price in an area that the median, let's say, is, is 300 in this, in this area, and then this house is going to go for, I don't know, 600, let's say. Instead of pricing on the bracket at 600, in those cases, when you're hot, much higher above, the most important number in your pricing is the first number. So in that case, I will do a 599. And I learned that in the Bay Area, there's a huge difference between listing a house at 1.9 and 2.01. There's just, there's a big, huge difference. People will see that one, um, like, uh, like buying something at Target and you see that it's 9.99, not $10. So, so there's my, my five cents around pricing. Um, okay, so we're going through pricing um, and we're going through everything on that. How do you think they're feeling now emotional? I had them, they were nervous at the door, got them calmed down again when they were talking, and now we're talking about pricing. So what's happening to their emotional level? Going up. It's going up, okay. So, so the nervousness is starting to come up on this one, all right? 
um, I want them nervous here. Okay, so I want to push that up. So when the market really sucked, I would actually do part as part of my um, pricing. I would show them here's all the things that are active, and here's and here's CDO, and here's the days on market, and here's all that sold in the last month. And I would show them that because I want them really, really nervous here. Um, I want them in that place because I'm going to move them even higher. I'm going to push that up higher. So the next segue after CMA is I'm going to ask right here. I'm going to say, are you ready to do the paperwork? I'm never going to call it um, a listing. I'm never going to call it a contract. I'm not going to use that word ever. Are you ready to do the paperwork? At this point, expect the objection. Okay. You may get a, uh, sure, we're ready to go. And then at that point, bring it out and, and run through the paperwork. But you're probably going to get an objection. So as soon as you get the objection, we haven't talked about commission yet. Okay, so, so as soon as I get that, I'm gonna isolate my objection. Is that the only thing that that's keeping you between you know, us handling the paperwork and getting your house in the market today? Yes, awesome. I'm gonna isolate it and then I'm gonna handle it with one of my commission objections. Um, we, we are not ready, we, blah, 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 blah. Is that the only thing? Isolate, handle, close again, okay? And it's that process every time they've got an objection. So I'm gonna isolate it, handle it, I'm gonna close again. Okay, ready to do the paperwork? And I'm gonna keep on doing that. So once I go through the paperwork, I am a firm believer in your paperwork that you should be able to take a listing contract or a buyer's contract or any contract for that matter, and you should have it you should know it well enough to have the contract in paper form. By the way, I'm going to bring paper and I'm going to do DocuSign. I'm going to do both. If you're about probably my age, if you're probably my age and up, you're kind of iffy. But if you're above my age, I'm going to do paper. And if you're below my age, I'm going to do um, on the computer on my iPad. And the reason why is my generation up, if you saw it in print, like in a newspaper, it was real and it was legit and you could believe it. But below my generation is all, if it's online, it's real and I can believe it. So I'm gonna parlay that knowledge and, and go with both uh, versions of the contract in front of me um, and then pull out whichever one is appropriate at that time. There's gonna be some caveats. There's an age band that's about 50 to 60, right in that range that could flip either direction. Um, and it really could, it could go either direction. And then sometimes you'll get a really techie, you know, 75 year old, really, really techie. And sometimes you'll get a millennial that doesn't do anything. One of my kids does nothing on the computer and they're a millennial. But for the most part, I'll pull out one or the other. And if I can tell this making nervous, I'll ask them, do you prefer paper or online? And then we'll do that. Either way, you should know your contract well enough to have the paperwork upside down and present that direction. This paragraph means this, this 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 sign date. Next page. This means this, this means this, this means this, sign date. All the way down through a contract. Okay, live or die by a contract. I believe that we're paid to know that thing on that level. So, so live or die by that contract. So I'm gonna go through the contract. I'm gonna go boom, 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 sign date, sign date. At this point. Can I ask the, a question? Yeah. When you're doing this digital signature on the iPad, how do you do that? Especially if there's like two people that need to sign. Um, that's a really good question. So I can DocuSign to both of them and go through where they've got it on theirs also, or they've got it on their phones. I'm still going to go through upside down with mine and I'm going to explain what everything is. So, but I'm going to have it on both versions with them. Okay. okay. But good question on that one. Um, now, Nervous level, they've just signed a contract, although we didn't call it a contract. They're at the highest level that they possibly can be stress-wise, okay? Like literally high, uh, lead disclosure first. Um, so Christina, good question again. I'm going to do whatever, um, uh, whatever the state law, like in Washington state, I have to do agency disclosure first, and then I have to do lead disclosure. I'm gonna go in the order that the state law makes me go in. Period. So whatever order the state law says on contracts, that's what I'm going to do. Okay. All right. So they're the highest level of stressed out, freaked out that possibly can be. You cannot leave people like this, ever leave people like this. So the next thing I do is I physically shove everything out of the way. And I'm like, ah, now that that's done. All right. 
So the next thing I'm going to do is I want you future thinking. So that's part four. You got the contract signed. I want you future thinking. Okay, now that that's done, when you guys move, where are you going? And I'm going to bring up a lot of excitement and I'm going to have a lot of energy in my voice. And oh my gosh, we're going to go to Arizona and blah, 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 blah whatever, blah, blah, blah. Oh, that sounds fabulous. I'm going to keep them in that future thinking place. Now that I've got them future thinking and really, really happy, I'm going to set expectations. Okay, so my expectations are this. Look, all right, every single Monday, you are going to hear from me. I'm going to let you know what's going on with the property. I'm going to do it on Mondays because we've had all the traffic in over the weekends. I'm going to contact all the agents. I'm going to get all the feedback and see kind of what's going on with the property. And then I'm always going to call you and let you know what's going on. So they will always get, they'll get actually a few things from me. They're going to get a report from me on Monday. It's automatically generated, but it looks like it's for me. And so there's one touch. And the second thing is they're going to get a phone call. Um, does any, um, on occasion, if I'm really, really busy and swamped, because when I set this process up, I had 85 listings. So it was, I mean, it's just, it's a lot of phone calls. So I will use slide dial. So is everyone here familiar with slide dial? Nope. Does anyone want to know what slide dial is? Yes. All right. Slide dial. All right. Slide dial is your new best friend. So uh, Google slide dial. S L Y and then the word dial, slide dial. So it's a phone number that you punch in that phone number first on your phone, and then you listen to a stupid ad. I don't know, 10 seconds, 30 seconds, whatever it is. And then it says, Are you ready to place your phone call? When you put in that cell phone number, it will buy, it only works for cell phones. It will bypass ringing the phone and go straight into the voicemail. So if you've ever missed a phone call where you're like, I never heard it ring, that's what slide dial does. So they have no clue on the other side, but you can get your message. So if you've got really chatty Kathy and you need to just get the information out so you can still do your touch, but move on to the next one, slide dial is your new friend. So, so I'm gonna always call you on Monday. I may slide dial you, but I'm always gonna, you're always gonna hear from me every single Monday because I never ever want that to be said. She put a sign in my yard and I never heard from her again. And when I was listing short sales, so sometimes it was nine months of Monday phone calls of me trying to figure out a new way to say, ain't nothing happening on your property again, you know, or the bank is still messing around with whatever it is. Um, but it's every single Monday, you're always going to hear from me. Um, so then I'm going to tell people, I'm going to say, look, you can call me anytime during the week. You're always going to hear from me on Mondays, but you can call me anytime during the week. Saturdays, I do appointments only. And Sundays, I, I usually take the day off. I spend one day with my husband. If there's an emergency, call 911. And then they kind of laugh. I'm like, and then call. Okay. So I set that up right out of the gate. So if there's an emergency, call 911 and then call me. A lot of times I'm really, really busy with clients. And so what I'll end up doing is I'll call you in between my clients or I'll call you at the end of the day. Sometimes it's really, really late at the end of the day, but I promise you, I will always call you. Now, here's the deal. When you make that promise, you always have to call them. So if you get that nervous person that is like bugging you and like burning your phone out, that you've got to always call that person, even if it ends up being late at night. And sometimes I would call with the, I'm so sorry. I know it's nine o'clock at night. This is the first break I've had today. The reason why I have my phone ringing in the beginning, but turned off because I want them to know that I'm with the client, just like when I was with you on that listing appointment, do not answer my phone. I'm with the client, but I promise I will call you in between. Okay. So those are my expectations I set up and I always do call them. Even if it ends up being late, if it's super late, I might slide dial you, but I want that phone before, you know, midnight. I want there to be that. Yes, I did reach out to you. So I set up those expectations. So I don't get, I don't want people bugging me, you know, because the water heater broke. I'm not, I don't fix water heaters, so, you know, call 911 or whoever you call for water heaters and then call me and let me know and we'll go deal with it. So that's what I set up. I set up those expectations and then I had to honor it. As long as I honored it, I didn't have issues with people. Okay, so the last step. So I've taken an emotional journey, uh, nervous, calmed down as they are talking, back nervous again as we talk CMA, more nervous for contract, calm down again for future thinking, set my expectations when they're very calm and very happy. And the last thing I'm always gonna leave on a listing from is next steps. Okay, so the next steps are, the photographer's gonna be contacting you by Tuesday and they're gonna be out here like Wednesday, you know, Tuesday, maybe Wednesday, you know, and then we're gonna go live on Thursday and then, you know, we're gonna do this and we're gonna do that. 
But the very next thing is the photographer's gonna be calling you next to get that appointment set up, okay? Awesome. If you need anything, you let me know. I'm so happy to be working with you. And I'm gonna leave them with that because emotional journey-wise, I've got you calm and happy in future thinking, and now I just made you competent because you know exactly what's gonna happen next. And you will always know that this is my next step. Your next step is I need you to contact your HOAs. I need you to get whatever it is. Whatever their next step is, leave them with their next steps. Awesome. If you need anything, give me a call. Okay. That is a ton of information. That is a listing appointment. That is super. Any questions or anything or any, anything that we didn't cover or anything, go back through chats. Let's see. Do you know what's your time frame on this from beginning to end usually? So in the beginning, good question Liz. In the beginning when I first started doing with the big huge book and all of that, it was two hours and it was painful for me. And at the end of the day, it was just like, ugh. If I'm not doing, um, and I've actually done in the beginning too, I took my own pictures, um, really great uh, uh, camera and all that. I don't do that anymore at all. So I'm probably in and out of your house in about an hour, maybe hour half if you have a lot of talking, but my goal is always to get it down to an hour. Perfect. Uh, all right. Um, how do you scrub it against the do not call list? Um, scrubbing who I'm calling? Against the do not call. So um, from what I understand, the guy who does our, our uh, phone number scrubs against the do not call list. Also for do not call, here's the main things about do not call. The first, um, and there's a couple of people I know that are on this call that can address it more than I also, but the main things are this. I don't use a triple dialer anymore, which is what I used to use because that's one of the things that they pop um, onto is, is the triple dialer. The second thing they're going after is the, um, um, the leg time, um, because the triple dialer will hang up on call number two. When you're on call number one, it will hang up on call number two, and it will call number two back, but there's a leg time between that call ringing and it coming through to you. And if that leg time is too long, they'll pop you on that all day long. So that's the second thing they'll pop you on. The third thing they'll pop you on is if they say do not call and you call back again and you don't have your own personal do not call list. So the do not call rules say that there's a national registry and there's your personal registry. So whenever I get someone who says, you know, don't call, I hate your guts or worse, whatever it is that they say, I immediately in my database, I change them to a trash lead. And so if the FCC ever came after me and said, you know, where's your do not call list? Here's all my trash people. Here's my entire do not call list. And then I make sure that I never, ever call that person again. They don't come after you as much as if it's like one instance, you know, that's not who they're looking for. They're looking for the big companies that continue to go after it again, keep on using triple yes. dialers, those kinds of things. Hey, Targan, um, most, and, and Gina actually mentioned the guy that we like to use, uh, Ansat Khalil, that David, David Evers found him. He's on the GIA workplace page. You can find that post with his link. Um, most m most the, the providers, the reptile providers will always do that. They advertise that. So always make sure you, you check it out. You ask them to use scrub against and do not call us before you ever pay anybody to do your skip tracing. But I, honestly, guys, if you want to do a show of hands or a hand raise, most everybody is focused on the team that's used, the NSAC, who's using, has had great results. I know, I know Brianna Latham, you've used them, and a number of us have used them. And so far, he's fast, he's affordable, and I haven't heard a single complaint, you know? Love it. Thanks, GP. Um, Tom just said, do you use a pre-listing questionnaire? Yes, I did. So, um, good question. On my pre-listing questionnaire, I actually had a, I had two. I had one for buyer calls and one for when I, for my listings was on the clipboard. I had them pre-printed off. I designed it in such a way that I could literally circle the answers. So when I asked how many bedrooms, I had, you know, one, two, three, four, five, and I could circle what it is, same with bathrooms, et cetera. Um, on that listing, uh, pre-listing questionnaire that I asked people, so as soon as they agreed, yes, um, I, I do, you know, yes, you can come over to our house, you know, Friday at three. I said, awesome. Well, I've got you on the line. Is it okay if I ask you a few questions? Tax records are wrong all the time. And then I'm going to go right through. I'm going to ask, so who are all the owners? Um, what is the square footage, bedrooms, bathrooms? Um, how long do you own the home? How much do you owe on it? 
Out of curiosity, what do you think your house is worth? I really want to know that one. Have you done any unpermitted, have you done any additions? Have you done any unpermitted additions? If they will not answer how much is your home worth, I'm going to ask a few more questions and then I'm going to say, out of curiosity, what are houses like yours and your neighborhood going for? Because usually they'll answer the second one. So I'll get my answer one out of the other. I want to know that because I need to know if I'm going into that listing where I've got to beat them up on price. So that's why I want to know that one. My very last question, will all the owners be present? No. Oh, okay. Well, um, let's do this. Let's just reschedule and, you know, for a time when everyone can't be present. Well, I don't know her schedule and she's not here. No worries. What we'll do, let's just pencil it in and then you can just let me know if it doesn't work after you chat with her. Um, so we'll just pencil it in and then I can get them to confirm with that. Um, which reminds me, there was another thing I didn't do. I did not reconfirm my appointments. And for me personally, that was a decision I made, even though I had a no-show rate, I A-B tested it. My no-show rate was less than when I confirmed. When I confirmed, they would switch the data, I would lose them. And so I did not reconfirm. I also though did not book any more than not the current uh, week Friday, but that next week Friday, I never booked beyond that. I didn't go out two weeks. I stayed within either this Friday or next Friday. If I went out that other Friday, I lost too many people. So I do, and I love the pre-listing questionnaire already printed out because I don't have to think. All I gotta do is grab my clipboard and start circling answers all the way through, okay? So what else we got answers? Um, thanks, do you use the pricing triangle to overcome pricing objections? Tom Silvestri, that is awesome. I don't because I have no clue what a pricing triangle is. <laughs> so what's a pricing triangle? You're on mute. So it's, it's a triangle and it shows you where you should price your house. And if you price it too high, uh, you're only gonna get one or two people to look at it and it's gonna get stale. And if you price it really low, you're gonna get a lot of offers and a lot of people to see it. And it explains the importance of pricing it properly. I love it. So I use, I use two things. One is a pricing bullseye. So same type of concept. So um, I talk about, we wanna get the bullseye. We get, um, and if we're on the outside, we get um, drive-bys, no showings. I'm trying to remember this off the top of my head. If we move in one bullseye level, we get showings, but no offers. Um, and if we uh, move further in, so I, so I kind of had that. And then I always also told them the NAR stat, two weeks, no showings, or 10 showings, no offer, you're overpriced. That NAR stat has been true even when the market was horrible. And when the market was horrible, it's still the, uh, the, a, a correctly priced house will have an offer within 15 days, even in 07, 8, 9, 10, 11. You will have your offer within 15 days if your price is correctly priced. So I use that. And then I use another graph that, I'll do it from your angle, from your guys' angle. Um, it had a bar and then a higher bar and then the bars progressively got smaller. And it was the life of a listing. And I said, so what's gonna happen is we're gonna list your house and we're gonna get some people looking online at it, first bar. And then everyone's gonna tell their agent and then we're gonna have the most showings that we're gonna have, highest bar. And then it's gonna, we'll get less and less and less showings until we're in a listing coma. And I use that phrase. So, and that is within a, I think the one that I originally had was weeks, but I switched that to days because the market was really hot. I said, this is the life of the listing. If your house gets into a listing coma, the only way to get you out of a listing coma is to do a price adjustment and it starts that process over again. And I use that phrase because if I needed to get a price adjustment, we would have the conversation of, look, your house is in a listing coma. I have to get you out of the listing coma. They will remember that. And then I'm much more likely to, they, they understand the concept and I got to get them you know, through their site. I also have done, um, when the market was really bad, I did um, pre, thank you for that, Roger. Um, apparently the pricing triangle is in the EXP presentation guide. Oh, I should look at that. Um, I also did, um, pre-dated, post-dated, pre-signed price adjustments. So I literally would go in with price adjustments priced 15 days out. So here's, you know, and I, I need you to sign this. If I'm gonna take an overpriced listing, um, you're gonna send price adjustment. You're, you're just going to, that's, here it is, sign it right here. Um, has anyone ever had a listing that they would not reduce the price that you knew they needed to reduce the price and you were beating your head against the wall and you could not get them to do it. Has anyone had that situation? 
Well, okay. I had a, if, back when, um, this was this was going back probably 13 years now, the market was at the peak, just like it is today. <laughs> and it just, I mean, it would like drop like a, like a lead balloon. But what I, what I did is it's um, kind of a different angle that we just talked about, but I literally walked in and with a yellow pad of paper and pen or pencil and drew a grid and across the top was their property and three or four or five, you know, supposedly comps, like a, one or two that they picked and then the ones that I, that I picked. And I'd have them go through the left, the, the, the left column, all the rows were all the variables, number of bedrooms, master bedroom, garage, kitchen, the whole nine yards, pool. And I'd, I'd have them go through and select the ones like, like, like and say, this is, this is the closest match. This was a, a, a five spot on. This one's a, least to like it. It's a one, like the number, like three car garage and everything else was a two car garage, that kind of thing. And have them go through and at the end, I'd say, well, which one then, then in your estimation is most like your house? And they would pick the correct one. And I'd say, well, let's look at that price, you know? And then they're, the, what they want, of course, was $100,000 more. And I'd say, well, do you really think that other people out there in the world are going to not be as smart as you are and be going through the same exact math that we just went because that's exactly what they're going to do with their, with their agents. And if you don't price it right in your own work, you just showed it, you just showed it to me, that's what people are going to pay, you know, yeah. wasn't always a, a, a win, but it definitely won a lot of times and it got me closer where I knew I needed to be, you know. I um, love that. We did something really similar to that. I had the pictures of the lowest price, the medium price and the highest. And yeah. I would just lay out the pictures in a line. Uh, here's yeah. the low price pictures, all the pictures, I printed all of them. Here's the low, mm -hmm. here's the medium, here's the high. And when I laid them all out, I said, which house is yours? And they will always go to the house that is theirs. They will go, mm -hmm. we know the difference between granite and formica counters. I mean, and they do too, right? So they yeah. will get that one. And I'm like, yep, this one's priced at 292. Mm -hmm. And so I did that one also. The other and, thing I did is I, yeah. I, had, I had them do the checking off and everything. I had them fill everything in. Love it. Yeah, because yeah. then they're self-discovering what it is. Mm -hmm. um, I had a guy one time, and I could not get him to reduce the price. We needed to do it. Adjust, by the way, is the price. He would not do it no matter what, and I was tired of dealing with this guy, and he would like, puff out his chest, and, I, uh, and I'm just like, oh, my gosh. So I was done, and I pulled this trick out. If you do this trick, you have to be willing to walk away from the listing. Like, you have to be like, I'm done. Like, he won't move. He won't budge. It's not going to sell. I'm done. So I showed up on a Friday afternoon at, I don't know, three o'clock, four o'clock, whatever time it was, but Friday afternoon. And I had the price adjustment already filled out with the price I wanted on it. And I had a cancellation, a listing cancellation form. I had both. So I went over there, slapped down the price adjustment. I said, we have to, we have to be here. This bottom line, we have to be here. And I'm not signing that. Uh, 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 and I was like, I thought you might feel that way. So here's a cancellation. I'm going to give you a day to think about it. I'm going to give you the weekend to think about it. You let me know by Monday. And I walked out and I got my phone call Saturday morning. We will adjust the price of our house. I got that price adjustment back and it sold that weekend. So, but the deal is I was totally willing to walk. I was like, if he signed it, I, I don't care. It's not going to sell. And you were a pain in my rear. So, so that's a last ditch effort. If I cannot get you to reduce any other way. Um, so yeah. I did that one also. I had, a, I had one one time, but this happened actually several times, but they would say, well, I, I like everything you do, but so-and-so said they would do it for some ridiculous, you know, 1% or 2% or something. And at first, I didn't know what to say. I said, I was like, well, okay, I'm just going to give the cheap guy, right? Then I realized, wait a second, I'm going to I'm going to play that card and say, you know what? They must really lack confidence in their ability to market your property or to really cut their price like that, you know? <laughs> So um, I had one that I loved. I used to use the $6. We're running over in time. If you guys are cool, I'll teach you guys the $6 commission handler. Do you guys want to learn this one? Yes. Yeah. All right. So I kept six crisp $1 bills in my purse. And so if they fought me on, I would go, I would go, is it okay if I teach you kind of how commission works? So you can understand. And, and always nod yes when you want them to be doing it. Yes, it is okay. So I pull out the six $1 bills and I go, okay. So here's how commission really works. So these three go to the other agent and I would take those three out and I put them on the table. Um, out of these three that are left, this one goes to my broker and I would set that one on the table. And then this one goes to all of my, um, my, my expenses for listing your house, 
um, this cost, this cost, this cost, this cost. And I would set that one down. And then I have $1 bills still in my hand. And this other, this one that's left, I'd rip it in half. This goes to my continuing education expenses. You want to take my half a dollar bill? And that usually got them. And then if any, they said anything about the 1% people, I would say, okay, now that you know how commission works, like you know where it all goes. Um, so my first question is, is he really a one percenter or was he a four percent? Because three is going to go away and one is going to stay with him. Oh, he's really a four percent. Okay, so really what we're dealing with is, is the difference between four and six. We're dealing with two. So now that you know how commission works and the cost of doing business and how it works, what do you think he has to do? I'm not saying he does this. I'm just saying, what do you think he probably has to do in order to make sure that he can stay in business tomorrow and the next day. Because we already know he can't stay in business with only 1%. And so you kind of work them through to where they understand, oh, he needs to do both sides of the transaction because then he can stay in business because he can't stay in business on only 1%. It, it's, not, it's not economically feasible to do that. Okay, so, so now that we, I, again, I'm not saying he's doing that. I'm just saying, what's the likelihood that he needs to do both sides of that transaction? It's pretty high. Okay, so knowing that, how likely are they to be showing you every single offer? And I just let it sit there. Now, I'm not gonna accuse, I'm not gonna name names, I'm not gonna point a finger, I'm just gonna ask you how likely is that you're going to see every offer? And would you rather get another offer in, hopefully that is, that is you know, $20,000 more and lose your 3,000 on commission or whatever the math actually works out to be, or are you really, really hung up on that 1% person that you know is not going to be in business to help you tomorrow? And that's one that I used a lot. So there's my $6 one. But you should have a good five in your pocket to be able to handle uh, commission objections. I love that one though. That was good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then you got to make sure you don't spend your six $1 bills because they need to stay in your purse or your wallet. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Anybody else have any other questions on anything? Commissions, listings, anything. That's a lot of rift bills. I know. And the bank will take them with tape on them. They will take them. I promise you. So I also like it because it gave me, can we use monopoly money? Um, that's a great question. I want, you should see people freak out when you rip a $1 bill. You, I mean, they're literally like, oh, you know, because we all know it's illegal and, and it is, and it's sacrilege on some level. So I like the effect, I really do, of ripping out a $1 bill. So. Can you see the, the portion where you're talking about the other agent? So I got the $6 broken down, but what was the- Okay, the so now, now, Mr. Seller, now that you understand how commission actually works, um, and you said there was, you know, guy down the street would do it for 1%, my question is, is it 1% or was he gonna give away, you know, 3% on the other side? So, or was he gonna do the whole thing for 1%? And act confused, like be like, you know, I, I don't understand, you know? Um, oh, well he was, okay, so really it's 4%. So now instead of, cause I gotta get them in their head away from dealing with one and six, which is five to four and six, which is two. Okay, so now that we know that, and now that we understand how commission works, um, and we are, and we know that it's not uh, feasible to stay in business at a one percent. Like we won't be able to be in business tomorrow because of where our commission actually goes. I'm not saying he's doing this, but how likely are you to, you know, what is he, what is he going to have to do in order to be able to stay in business? You know, and then I'm going to work them through until they understand that he's got to do deals on both sides. He's got to double end. Mm -hmm. Um, and actually, um, I've seen different areas where agents have too high a rate. I don't have a problem with double ending if it's legal in your state. I've got no issues with that. If you can right. do, it, do it legal. Know this, if you're going to get sued, you're going to get sued for double ending. But if you do it right, you're safe and protected. So I, I have no moral issues. I actually like with the, working with an agent on the other side that I know will do good business. So I have no issues with that. Um, but if someone double ends at a very high percentage, I am going to have those stats and I'm going to address that situation. Again, I'm not gonna accuse, I'm always gonna ask the questions. They double end a lot of business, much higher than the industry standard. They do 1%. Why do you think that is? Yeah. Now that you know how commission works. Yeah. Don't yeah. do that. I love it. Thanks. Got it. Yeah. Thanks so much, Targan.
Yeah. Please drop them. All right. Anybody else have anything since I'm running this over and I don't, I want to be respectful of your all's times. Yep. Let me check the chat box one more time. I think we're good. I think we're doing pretty good. Hey guys, could, would you mind giving Gina a big hand? Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you very yay. much. Yay. Yeah. I will do anything for praise and applause. I'm just telling you. <laughs> <laughs> well, Gina, I got to tell you. Oh, you, thanks, PF. Yeah. You, you have no idea how, how much I appreciate this because guess what this week is? What is this week? Gig week. The, every fourth month I teach. So I'm teaching tomorrow night, Wednesday night, and Thursday night. And Thursday night, as far as I know, after I teach the California groups, yeah. After that, at midnight, I teach Hawaii. <laughs> oh no! I got some Hawaiians on the team, so I don't. I don't know what I'm going to look like on Friday. Look at look at PF. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Thank you. Oh but, my god! I don't know if there's enough coffee for me. I turn into a pumpkin at ten o'clock, y'all. Like I don't know if yeah. I can be <laughs> midnight teaching yeah. here. Good job. So. I'll, I'll I'll figure it out. I mean, I've I've. It's funny thing is, I can something about my stamina. I can drive. Like 15 hours, 16 hours, but mm -hmm. but my voice goes when I talk on that. I can't I can't keep going, you know. So we'll 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 see how maybe I should just go to Hawaii. Lisa, hey, should Gary, I go to Hawaii? Good hey plan. Gary, this is Lisa. And I just heard from Honolulu last week, and I not only am going to have my salesperson's license back, but I will have a broker's license for the state of Hawaii. Nice. So I was gonna message you today and say, let's go to Maui and then we'll zoom with the guy over on the big island on his next meeting will run it on uh two islands that sounds good to me i'll sleep i'll sleep up with the centipedes with a tent oh no, you don't want to camp outside and you don't want to ground floor or anything centipedes are not fun yeah guys so you know hawaii centipedes are like 10 feet long no 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 <laughs> <Pretty much. laughs> they're heat seekers and they're nocturnal they're not fun <laughs> so, but in case, Gina, I really do appreciate it. And I appreciate you know, everything you guys do, you know, Tom and Susan for teaching the other week. And uh, for those of you who don't know, we actually won, we finally won the zoning hearing for the big, the big uh, church property. And uh, it was, I tell you what, I've, I've been to zoning hearings lots, but I've never seen people put up such a fight. And I finally said, I said, look, guys, you don't understand. If you don't go with Benny, you actually met Benny. You guys met Benny. I said, you don't know what you're going to have. Benny's grade A top-notch investor. The idea is ideal for the community. And any other alternative is not as good. And I said, the worst thing is you leave it sit there empty. I mean, I was literally like getting passionate about it. And at the end, that the board went back and voted. And, and they said they would rather not have it empty anymore. So we're going to go with Benny. So in any case, I'll fill you guys in on that project. we got a really neat project going with that. And, you know, it could be something else to model across the country. And I'll, I'll fill you in on that also when, once we once we have it, um, once it's up and running, you know, I'll share it with you. But in any case, uh, thanks again, Gina. Thanks, you guys, for participating. Um, if you're going to be in the gigs this week, uh, please participate and help help your uh, fellow gig leaders um, getting, you know, gain some engagement and things like that. So we're, we're making progress, you know. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Gare. Yes, it's time for ice cream. Yep. So what Bye, you Bye. Thank you. Oh, Christina Coleman on Team Capital. Um, we had a meeting this weekend. Keep I'll keep you posted, but we did a beta test. We already got three clients in the beta test. So we're pulled for those of you who don't know, we're pulling POL pulling cash values from individual whole life policies into a pool of funds and through a mortgage broker, make those funds available to our investors. So we're really bringing together the investor with a private lender, but it's not hard money. It's not bank money. So it's not, they're not traditional bank loans, but it's also not hard money. It's kind of a, a in-between. And I think it's going to be a very important uh, uh, resource for us as, as the economy changes. By the way, I got to ask this question. We have agents in 24 states now in the last week, at least last week, I think half the one-on-ones have had people say, you know what, my phone has really slowed down. There's not as many incoming calls. Does anybody notice that? Incoming calls have slowed down. 
Yep. So, I mean, we may have a long ways to go before any real correction sets. So I don't know. I mean, in 2007, in August and September, who predicted it? In August and September, probably nobody. And it was fast. So, so the, the, I'm not trying to scare. The point is, is you're doing the right things by being prepared and uh, building up this part of your business. Go for the listings and definitely make sure the investors are part of that because we just had this conversation yesterday at a cookout. Um, and the, the reality is, is it doesn't matter what the economy is doing, investors are always investing. So it's so like the Boy Scouts do, pre be, be prepared, you know? So, okay, that's my preaching moment for today. Time for ice cream. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank You're you. Welcome.